Hi, everyone. Welcome to hey. the broadcast. Hey. Good so, afternoon. Good afternoon. Indeed. Good morning. Well, it's good morning for Russia and for Switzerland. <laughs> so you're not in Siberia, I can see. Yeah, I, I actually really like this uh, feature that now uh, you show the geolocation of everyone. So much for privacy, of course, but still, it's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, you, you've got to find me amongst half a million people. You know, I'm in Bristol, and uh, <laughs> uh, that's it. So, yeah, here it's 9.30 in the morning, so I'm enjoying – this is probably the third cup of coffee today, so that's about 9.30. Um, so by the time <laughs> I get to lunchtime where you are. <laughs> nice. So we're going to talk about lambdas, but uh, aren't lambdas uh, just function pointers in C++? I, I'm not really familiar with it, but uh, that's what I heard. No. That's one way they are related to it as an idea, but uh, there's a little bit more to it than that. And I think the um, the idea of uh, we can start with the idea that um, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could define um, functions that uh, did not have names? In other words, something that I could simply pass. One of the strengths of C is the idea that I can pass functions as data. This is actually a very old idea in procedural programming languages and goes back to the 1960s. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's one that C is kind of famous for, the idea I can just simply do that, have callbacks. But I don't always want to name a function. Sometimes I just want to be able to say, here is a block of code. I want you to pass that. But the other thing, one thing that C did miss and therefore C++ missed was the idea that a function like a block can see its outer scope, its surrounding scope, but you can't nest functions in C. Um, in other words, they can't see other local variables. And so C++ offers us a different road into that. What about having um, objects that represent this kind of state? And it's building on these two ideas that gives us lambdas um, from C++ 11 onwards. The idea of basically saying, I want to pass a piece of code and I want to treat it as if it were a function. And that very much is, is the basis of how they're expressed in C++. Yeah, that makes and I can sense. recommend the uh, book from Ivan on functional programming in C++ with a wonderful explanation of what Lambda is. Cool. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yeah. So today we're going to be taking a very different, so, so uh, 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 Ivan's, Ivan will focus. He's focused on all the practical good stuff. I'm going to focus on other stuff. I'm going to focus on the weird stuff. And honestly, where did lambdas come from? Um, it also turns out they are not unique to functional programming. They are a procedural idea and an object oriented idea. They are a foundational idea. But what are some of the crazy ideas um, that we get out of uh, or that we can do with this? And the original lambda calculus. And what is interesting about C. Um, is that you can actually express many of the original Lambda calculus ideas in C++, which you, you couldn't perhaps do. Perhaps you also have yeah. some slides to share. I do indeed. And now is an excellent time for you guys to sit back and either enjoy a mid-morning coffee um, or lunch. Um, you know, I leave it to you. There's always a meal for whatever time of day there is. Um, breakfast, second breakfast, you know, there's all of these options. So, okay. In fact... That idea of breakfast and second breakfast counting, counting is something we're going to do in this talk. So, um, yeah, let's let's uh, kick off with the slides and um, and have a bit of fun with lambdas. And I do genuinely want to emphasize here um, for people that we are doing this is an intellectual exploration. It's intended to be um, fun and enjoyable um, and you will learn a few things computer science wise out of this uh, and perhaps some things you didn't know that you could do in C++, it'll give you a different point of view. I'm not recommending that you necessarily take the code that I show and put it in your production code. I suspect your colleagues will not thank you for this. Okay, so Lambda, you keep using that letter. Now that is a, um, if you've not seen it, that's a reference to the Princess Bride um, uh, uh, film from the late 1980s. Um, and it, there, are, there are a whole load of memes associated with that. and. Let's just start. I mean, this is a very fine letter. Honestly, if I had to have a favorite letter in the Greek alphabet, this is probably one of my top three favorites. Um, 
But these days it is used in so many contexts that people, um, uh, you sometimes have to clarify. For some people, um, it means AWS, even though AWS Lambda has absolutely nothing to do with Lambdas. Um, uh, for some people, this uh, triggers the idea of the game, Half-Life. Um, it's borrowed from physics. It's the decay constant, which is why it's borrowed into Half-Life. But hey, physicists, they like to recycle letters, so it also means wavelength. Um, and there is also Lambda Calculus, and that is the one that we're interested in today. Now, a lot of programming languages have gotten incredibly excited about adding lambdas in recent years. Um, you know, C++ did it in 2011. Um, uh, Java did it in 2014. Uh, C Sharp did it in 2002, 2003 with anonymous delegates and then added another form. Um, JavaScript has added them twice, but started off with them in the mid-1990s. Um, Lisp kind of has the claim to fame here. It actually, the first working implementation of Lisp was 1960. But... So basically all the programming languages that people are getting excited about are catching up with what Lisp was doing um, 60 years ago. But actually, where does this come from? It comes from outside programming. Um, it comes from Alonzo Church. Um, back in 1932, he introduced uh, Lambda Calculus. Um, this was a paper that I struggled to get my hands on. It's, it's not widely uh, easily uh, found on the internet. And um, uh, uh, Eduardo Simões managed to dig this out for me when, on a previous talk where I mentioned that I couldn't find this paper. And it's Alonzo Church's original um, attempt at trying to solve a uh, problem related to logic, and he invented a calculus form. It actually turns out there were some flaws in that paper, but this does take us back to 1932. Lambdas are old. But there are some interesting philosophical observations that kind of set the scene. Um, he makes an observation, we do not attach any character of uniqueness or absolute truth to any particular system of logic. He's saying here that he doesn't think that logic is foundational to the universe. He doesn't say, he's not saying that, yeah, just because we've got this calculus does not mean there's anything deeper. Um, it is, as he says, the entities of formal logic are abstractions. They are invented. Um, they, their use in describing and systematizing facts of experience of observation and their properties determined by intended use, depend for their exact character on the arbitrary choice of the inventor. In other words, this is very much the view, there are different schools of thought that mathematics is discovered or mathematics is invented. Um, Church is definitely coming down on the idea that it's invented, and he doesn't say there's anything deeper about this. But he does highlight some things um, that he then went on to demonstrate in his 1936 paper, which is actually where this really started getting going, an unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. Now, you've got to understand the context here in the 1930s. <laughs> in the 1930s, um, what was happening from the 1920s and 1930s is that all of the old certainties of mathematics and physics were slowly crumbling. Um, so at the end of the 19th century, uh, it was widely believed that mathematics could be demonstrated to be complete um, and logical and consistent um, and self-contained, um, and that this would also apply to physics and all these other things. Um, Einstein's relativity doesn't really have any bearing on this, but quantum mechanics in the 1920s started messing things up. People said, wait a minute, there's things that we can't know. And then we started discovering that it was not as good as we thought. Because in 1911, seemingly according to the goal, um, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, the philosopher Bertrand Russell and um, Alfred North Whitehead published Principia Mathemat uh, Mathematica with the goal of providing a solid foundation for all of mathematics. This was a proof that mathematics was complete and self-contained and consistent. And that was that fitted the idea that we had that we were almost at the end of having to know everything that we everything was going to be complete and then things started happening both in physics and in mathematics in 1931 kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem shattered the dream showing that for any consistent axiomatic system there will always be theorems that cannot be proven within the system and this is the context that alonzo church was living in and this is what his papers were exploring. Um, there are also some interesting observations here. This is from a piece by Adrian Collier earlier this year, um, where he talks about, he applies this to understanding the fairness of machine learning systems. Uh, he says, one premise of many models of fairness in machine learning is that you can measure or prove the fairness 
of a machine learning model from within the system that you have built. So from properties of the model itself and the data it is trained on. However, what we see is that Girdle already got there, you know, years ahead of us to show that a machine learning model is fair, you need information from outside of the system. So we ended up with this observation that was made uh, in Douglas Adams's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, uh, by philosophers. We demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. That is what um, Alonzo Church basically created uh, Lambda Calculus to do. He didn't create it so that we can have fun with programming languages. He created it as a simple calculus that demonstrated, allowed him to demonstrate certain things um, related to incompleteness. Now, Lisp is, as I said, the first language where uh, we pay attention to this, where it got introduced. And um, so Lisp was designed in the late 1950s, uh, but the first working implementation was 1960. So I tend to consider it a language of the 1960s. It was kind of vaporware in the 1950s. Um, I also happen to quite like old books. This is uh, um, uh, my uh, a copy of the Lisp uh, programmer's manual from the early 1960s. Um, but what we see is, as I said before, we see it's all over, loads of programming languages. And the observations I was making just before the session in conversation, um, uh, I, I've, uh, you can see here on a page um, about Ruby. Um, so I was digging around a few months ago for quotes that I could use um, uh, uh, concerning lambdas uh, for uh, presentations. And what I thought was interesting <coughs> um, was this characterization of what is a lambda. Despite the fancy name, apparently using a word that describes a letter in another language is fancy, but despite the fancy name, a lambda is just a function, but peculiarly without a name. Now, this actually allows us to address one of, uh, one of the big uh, issues. Um, Phil Carlton's famous quote, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Well, if lambdas don't have names, we've solved one of them. And because we are talking about lambda calculus and we talk about mathematics, um, there are no side effects. So if there are no side effects, then there's no concept of caching. There's no state, and therefore we have solved all of the problems of computer science, and we haven't even finished Friday, so we're doing very well. But let's go back to Church's paper. Let's understand how did he define this stuff. And he said, right, we select a particular list of symbols, open curly, close curly, open paren, close paren, Lambda and open and close square brackets. Hey, apart from Lambda, these are all very familiar to the C++ program. So, you know, we're on familiar territory. And then he says this lovely thing, an innumerably infinite set of symbols, A, B, C, dot, 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 to be called variables, okay? So just as a clarification, people often confused by this idea of variables, um, particularly in functional programming languages, which don't support assignment, um, and one of the ideas of functional programming languages is functional purity. In other words, there are no side effects. A function does not have side effects, which means you cannot change things. Um, if you can't change a variable, does it vary? And we sometimes get the same thing in, the, in C++ when we talk about const variables. Well, hang on, if it's const variable, then it doesn't vary. If it's const expra variables, then it doesn't vary. The reference, this is a mathematical concept. A variable is something that is not a constant. In other words, it is not the same in every single occurrence or use of the equation. It doesn't have anything to do with assignment. It just simply means that this is um, open um, to how you're going to use it. Uh, so that is what is meant in this context. And he says, we define the word formula to mean any finite sequence of symbols out of this list. So he's really des describing almost a grammatical level of what, we, what is it that we're going to say. Now, this immediately gives us a shift. Historically, we, up until this point, but actually still, I certainly was taught this in school um, and at university, this is the default way we think about functions. A function is a special thing. On the left-hand side, we are defining the relationship of function f with respect to a variable, a parameter x, in terms of the thing on the right-hand side, which is a formula. Now, what we do with lambdas is actually something slightly different. Um, we are saying f here is simply an abbreviation. We are saying that functional abstraction, it's not a special thing to do with the left-hand side. We're actually saying it's intrinsic to the kind of values we're dealing with, that just as we can have numbers um, and just as we can have sets, we can also have constructions that are functional. 
and that they are freestanding. They don't need to be defined by some special syntax form uh, on the left-hand side. It's to do with the right-hand side. So therefore, we can get rid of that completely. The F is not part of the function. Um, it is nameless. So here are, so I'm going to give you basically the three rules or the three laws of what is a lambda. A lambda is something that is with respect to a variable. It is a functional abstraction and it supports application. Okay, in other words, y is being applied to x here. If it helps you think about it, you can put parentheses around the x. y, open paren, x, close paren. Okay, but in the original lambda, um, there are only lambdas, there are no numbers, there are only lambdas. Um, all lambdas take one parameter, so they don't take zero and they don't take two. Uh, they just take one. And so therefore the syntax is pretty unambiguous. So we, you are always working with lambdas. But these are the three laws. Um, then we have this other syntax I threw in. Um, that is an abbreviation. What it means by an abbreviation rather than a definition is that you cannot use F on the right hand side. F is just a shorthand, it's like a macro. It's a shorthand for what's on the right-hand side. Um, therefore, their lambdas do not support recursion. That is not a thing. If you're thinking at this point, wait a minute, but in functional programming, they talk about recursion all the time. Yeah, I wanna make sure that we understand that lambdas are nothing to do with functional programming. Functional programming certainly uses lambdas, but you can be using lambdas and not doing anything that is functional, recognizably functional programming. Um, to do recursion in um, functional programming uh, through lambdas, you have to use uh, things called combinators, Y combinators or Z combinators. That's way outside the scope of this talk. We're not gonna talk about that. But this is an abbreviation. Then we have our variables. There are bound variables, those are parameters, and then there are free variables. They refer to some outer scope. So if we take our traditional view of functions and we say square of X, and I'm gonna reintroduce the multiplication operator, here because I want to make it explicit. Um, uh, what is the square of x? It's x times x. Okay. Um, if I convert this into lambda form, then we say that square is an abbreviation. It's a shorthand for an expression that applies, um, uh, that is a lambda expression that uh, abstracts um, x times x with respect to x. And there is a, an idea in uh, lambda calculus called alpha equivalence. It actually doesn't matter what you call these things. It could be x. Um, remember he said innumerably infinite symbols. Now I'm not saying that Alonzo Church uh, allowed emoji in his original definition of lambdas, but he allowed emoji in his original definition of lambdas. We can choose any symbol and it's still equivalent. In fact, we can replace square with a square. Um, so um, uh, this means that at this point with those frowning faces, we have a cross product um, and I can apply that expression to a number. So uh, as I said, we're gonna step outside the pure lambda calculus, we're gonna use numbers. I could write it like this, or I could actually introduce the lambda form itself. So all of these are equivalent and all of these are possible. But let's go back to this. Let's look at the title, an unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. What is interesting is that we all think of numbers and maths as being quite simple the basic stuff, the arithmetic, the numbers, those are all a simple idea. And all the complexity of mathematics is built on top of this stuff. But numbers are too complex. Um, numbers are too hard. So Alonzo Church decided that if he was going to start talking about number theory, the thing he needed was something that is simpler than the numbers that we work with, simpler than integers. So he got rid of numbers. He basically said, there are no numbers, there are only lambdas and I'm gonna build my own numbers, okay? So this is the ultimate in software craft. You, you reject the numbers that other people have given you, you reject that, and you build your own artisan crafted numbers. And where do we begin? Well, we're gonna begin at zero. Interestingly enough, um, uh, Church's paper doesn't begin at zero, he actually starts at one. Um, uh, but we're gonna begin at zero, um, and we are going to define uh, zero is a shorthand. It's an abbreviation for this expression. Um, uh, lambda of f applied uh, with respect to lambda of x, um, which yields x. That doesn't seem at all obvious. Then with one, we're going to actually use f. So for zero, we didn't use f. For one, we're going to use f. It's still not clear what's going on. But now it's beginning possibly to become a little clearer because in two, we apply F 
to f of x. In other words, we use f twice, and 3 we use f three times. You see the pattern here. We are describing um, numbers in terms of application of function. In other words, we're not saying what a number is, we're just saying a number is a doing thing, a number is a process, it's an application of. Now, in the original paper, there is an accommodation. I remember I just said a few minutes ago that in the original lambda calculus, lambdas take one argument. Um, because it's so common that you want to apply to apply something, uh, you know, there's a special syntax, and that gives us a much more familiar idea. Oh, this is a lambda with respect to two parameters, f and x. So we'll use this shorthand here. Um, and there's actually another way of writing these applications, f of f of x. Um, we could write it like that or even like this. Um, we can count the numbers and the ways. So there's a very profound and very deep idea here. We are not describing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 as platonic entities, things that exist out in the universe. We are describing them as things that happen. Things, uh, we're describing fiveness or threeness. Threeness is applying, is doing something three times. Whatever that something is, it's f. It's doing something, f, to something else, x, three times. That is what three is. It is the threeness of this. If we take the next number off the screen, seven, then actually there's an interesting idea here. We are effectively describing numbers as objects that do things. This idea can be found taken to a logical extreme in um, the language small talk, uh, one of the original object-oriented languages, um, which had a very heavy influence on Ruby. Given that I quoted a Ruby um, uh, uh, piece earlier, um, let's actually look at what Ruby does with this. You can actually send a method request to the number seven. Uh, in the C++ world, we've got used to thinking of fundamental types as being these fundamental types. They are bit representations, they are numbers, and numbers don't do things, they just are things. You do things to numbers. Here, we're actually saying that seven encapsulates the idea of repeating something seven times, and I can give it a block of code, which is in fact basically a lambda. I'm going to pass in something that will be applied seven times, and when I run this piece of code, it does this. So. That's quite neat. Now, let's look at this from another point of view. We're going to dig into the foundations of mathematics here. So if that is zero, lambda of f applied to x, except, or rather, f and x, but we ignore f, we're not going to apply it, because that's zero, then there's another way of describing this. The one is the successor of zero. 2 is the successor of the successor of 0. In other words, successor is simply the number that comes after, and so on. This is what is known as Peano's axioms, or comes from Peano's axioms. The way we can define integers is all you need to be able to do is define 0. If I can define nothing, and then I can say the one after nothing, then I can define all of the, um, uh, I can then define uh, all of the natural numbers. Um, so. Once I've got a successor relationship, I can do that. Now, I can write this as a shorthand like this, or probably more usefully, like this. Very simple idea. One is the successor of zero, two is the successor of one, three is, this makes sense. So you can build the whole of um, uh, discrete mathematics starting from here. Um, why is this useful? At the moment, not yet, but we'll come back to it. I, but I will leave you with this idea that here is what the successor relationship looks like if I describe it in lambda calculus. Okay, so let's get back to this idea and let's get to some C++ here. You may have heard of lambdas before, perhaps you've used them in other languages. So yeah, C++11 incorporated lambdas um, and uh, uh, here in C++20 um, we now live in an, uh, in an auto, you know, you can pretty much write most things without um, explicit types, we can auto only everything. So given that the original lambda calculus was untyped, I'm going to kind of follow that um, uh, here, and I'm going to find that equivalent of square. So this is how I would conventionally describe the square function in its general form, auto square. So this looks like a conventional function. I'm defining a name and then defining what that name means. Uh, and I can also refer to that name, should I wish to. I can recursively call square. Uh, we don't need to do that here. What does this look like from a lambda point of view? Actually, it's a very simple shift. Okay, from a lambda point of view, I'm saying, ah, right, I have an expression 
that happens to be a functional abstraction and I'm assigning it to a variable. It can be passed around and treated as data. I can apply it to the number seven, like a function. I can also substitute, because it's an abbreviation, that very expression and apply it straight in here or shorthand it um, down to this. <laughs> now, <laughs> this, one, this one is also from the Ruby uh, tutorial. I thought, whoa, anonymous little functional spies sneaking into the rest of your code. I'm not sure we need any more spies in our code. Uh, we, we, we have enough issues with uh, spyware and uh, uh, questions of what social um, media platforms are doing um, to the uh, world and its politics. So I don't think we need more of that. But people often associate lambdas very, very strongly with functional programming. But as I said before, they're not necessarily intrinsic. to They, they describe functional programming very well. Um, and they were introduced with Lisp into the programming world. But that's not actually how many people thought about them. Uh, and it's not unique and, and and central to functional programming. In fact, Excel, um, uh, so Simon Peyton Jones is often associated with uh, Haskell, a very functional language indeed, um, as often makes the observation that Excel is the world's most popular functional language. Um, it's it's uh, data flow oriented, expression oriented, um, it lacks any side effects until you do VBA. Um, it, it's, you know, it's very profound. But there is no concept of being able to define a lambda within that uh, frame. But it is pure functions and immutable state. Um, but let's go back to Lisp. Let's see how it applies um, this kind of thinking. This is how I would describe a lambda in Lisp. Very clear. Lambda of x, it uses um, a prefix notation. Um, for multiplication or for any operation. Um, uh, the thing of interest is on the left-hand side and then um, uh, the operation is the rest. It's a very uniform syntax, it's a very elegant syntax, uh, but this is defining a function that does something, or rather it's defining a functional expression and then I can apply it just like this. I wanna pick up on something I said earlier because here I'm we're kind of talking a lot about, hey, functional, functional, but I wanna get away from that idea. It is important in the functional world, but it's also very central to the procedural world, but it is an aspect of procedural programming that people often forgot. And in C, um, uh, what, what that got stripped down to was the idea of function pointers. Um, and it's only when C++ added objects and the function call operator overloading that people started going, oh, well, maybe here's a crazy idea, but they thought of it in terms of objects at that point. But I wanna go back to the 1960s, um, Algol 68, um, uh, which um, algorithmic language, very procedural language, a very elegant language. It's probably one of the most influential languages you've either never heard of or never used. Um, as a C++ programmer, clearly this has a huge influence because Algol introduced various words like int up until this point. Everybody called them integer. Um, bool, void, struct, union. All of these keywords, these are actually all come from Algol. The Algol uniquely um, uh, abbreviated these. Um, but let's have a look at Square. I've got to be very specific about the types. Algol is, um, doesn't have any kind of like type um, uh, genericity um, uh, at all. Um, but what you're looking at is the equivalent of the Lambda expression for integers. Um, it takes an ink, uh, it takes uh, an int. Um, x and it yield, it returns an int and it is defined as x times x. And I can assign it to a variable. So this is what you could do in the late 60s. What happened? <laughs> we had it all. It was so you can pass it around because this is a procedural concept, because you can pass um, a so let's be very clear, lambdas in C++ are not really a functional concept because you can do side effects in them. Lambdas are side effect free. But Algol is a procedural language, as indeed is C, and therefore uh, its backbone for C++ is procedural and imperative. Now, we might encourage people to not do that. Functional programming has a lot of benefits. Um, the ability to reason about code without side effects is incredibly powerful. The safety, the scalability, all of these things, that's a different talk. What I want to point out here is that this, in some senses, is a lambda, but because I could actually easily have side effects inside this, then technically it's not. It's a procedure that has no name. It is a procedural abstraction. In other words, it's at the heart of proceduralism. This is how I would declare the variable, and here's how I would use it, just as I would ordinarily use any kind of function. And it is a true, it does support true lambda concepts, um, if I want to look at it from one point of view, because I can simply take the expression and apply it. That's quite important, because a lot of languages um, 
and I'm going to pick on Java and C Sharp, they say they have lambdas, they have constructs that are called lambdas, but they're not actually true lambdas because you cannot write this kind of expression. You cannot, one of the key ideas is that lambdas can be applied and you cannot do that directly in those languages. So lambdas are functions and lambdas are procedures. And guess what? Lambdas in Ruby are also objects, just like everything else. Ah, okay, so they're objects as well. Okay, what I like about lambdas is they unify the paradigms and it's more a case of it's it's more a case of which point of view you look at. Okay, so we had lambdas in Algol, we had um, lambdas um, in uh, uh, Lisp, we had lambdas in C plus plus. So are they procedures, functions, or objects? The answer is yes, they are. Um, but the way they're expressed in each language tends to be different. Ruby is an object-oriented language, and therefore its center, its logical. Um, aspect is that these are objects. You see the same in Python, everything is an object. In C, and therefore uh, C, everything is functions or simple data, C++ goes a step further and says, no, there are things that are interesting. And the way that lambdas got realized in um, uh, C++, um, in the typical sense of how they used, guess what? They're objects. That is the way that C++ got its functional groove on, if you like, or became a more complete fun um, procedural language or fulfilled its destiny as an object-oriented language. Um, as a, an aside, um, in uh, Java, when Java added lambdas, it didn't become more functional. It actually became more object-oriented because now you could uniformly treat methods and blocks of code as if they were objects. That is the object paradigm, treating everything as if it's an object. Functional paradigm, everything as if it's a function. Well, actually that's not true. In the functional paradigm, you don't do that. In the functional paradigm, you normally don't treat everything as if it's an object. Um, types normally apply to fundamental types and they are not considered to be functional. Um, but we have this basic idea. This is how they're expressed. If I write this in C++, that very expression, the compiler will translate this into something a little bit more like this. It'll translate it into an anonymous, um, uh, you know, an unnamed uh, type. So it will have all of the concepts uh, necessary. It will have capture and um, to uh, deal with any magic constructor arguments. And so this is the way that the compiler will view it. It'll see this and say, ah, you mean one of these. So they are function objects. They are objects that support the function call operator. But one clarification, they are not functors. Um, this usage became popular in the early 90s. Um, I think it was promoted by Jim Kaplan and his advanced programming, uh, his advanced C++ programming styles and idioms book. Uh, he used the term probably because it sounded kind of cool, um, but uh, functors are a concept from category theory, which I'm not even going to pretend to properly understand. I'm not a mathematician by training. I, my background is originally natural sciences and then computer science. Um, but they are not, um, uh, they are mappings between categories rather than between uh, values. So they're not functors. Uh, Alex Stepanoff, um, when he developed the uh, standard template library, he was very clear about using the term function object. He didn't, I mean, he's a mathematician by training, and so therefore he didn't want to misuse the terminology. But what you're seeing here is there's this kind of interesting, almost paradoxical aspect that the lambdas have many faces. So there was this uh, write-up a number of years ago based, uh, inspired by the writings of Guy Steele. Um, Guy Steele is... Uh, He's been involved in a lot of uh, programming language work, um, C, Lisp, uh, and other, uh, uh, other languages. And he, uh, he's, he's, his talks, uh, I attended a couple of his talks, always interesting. He loves programming languages, and he loves interesting things. And he used to write these stories, but somebody was inspired um, uh, you know, to write something based on his work. And so we have the idea of the venerable master, Kwok Nam walking with his student, Anton, and hoping to prompt his master into a discussion. Anton said, Master, I have heard that objects are a very good thing. Is this true? Kwakna looked pityingly at his student and replied, ha, foolish pupil, objects are merely a poor man's closures. So let's talk about closures. Closures are an idea that come from the 1960s. They were based, uh, they were effectively created to allow us to evaluate lambdas. Um, and uh, Peter Landon gets the credit um, for this particular term. Um, now the term closure normally is, uh, it, it, the way we normally talk about closures is 
um, is uh, to consider if we're talking about lambda calculus that um, all closures are lambdas, but not all lambdas are closures. What do we mean by that? A closure is effectively a piece of code, a lambda, but it has two parts, the control part, which is the code that gets executed, and the environment part, or the context part, that which provides the values for its variables. Um, the, this word was misused slightly in um, Object Pascal, um, Ball and Delphi, for example, um, has a concept called closure, and that is just a, a bound um, uh, member function pointer. That's You can kind of see there's two parts to it. There's a pointer to the object, and there's a pointer to the control flow part, which is the function. But that's not what was really meant. Um, uh, it was actually a deeper idea. Um, it's the idea of taking a lambda and closing those free variables and binding them and saying, ah, here is the scope. Um, it's a closed expression. Here are the values that are used here. This value, uh, this approach was adopted um, when uh, Gerard Sussman and Guy Steele, the Guy Steele I just mentioned, um, they developed the scheme language in the 1970s. Uh, scheme is a kind of lisp, um, but unlike the original lisp, it has proper scoping. What you or I as a C++ developer would assume is scoping, proper scoping. Um, it's lexical scoping, whereas the original Lisp, because it's so dynamic, and this is also reflected in um, uh, other Lisp dialects like eLisp, as used in Emacs, uh, uses dynamic scoping, which basically means that how a function executes depends, which variables are actually looked up depends on where it's called, uh, rather than where it is defined. Um, uh, this is a little bit like writing shell scripts and getting surprises. So uh, there is this idea, they wanted a much more regular approach to be unsurprised, to see that the scope that I see is the scope that will be executed. Um, but that means you're binding together these two aspects, and that binding uh, state and behavior. Hmm, this sounds familiar. So chastised, Anton took his leave from his master and returned to his cell, intent on studying closures. He carefully read the entire Lambda the Ultimate series of papers and his cousins. Lambda the Ultimate um, was a series of papers um, Guy Steele and others uh, wrote in the 1970s because they were so taken with how powerful lambda calculus was. They would often say, you can define anything in terms of lambdas. Lambda, lambdas are the ultimate whatever. They are the ultimate object. They are the ultimate procedure. They are the ultimate, you know, they, they were wherever there was a computational problem, you could define it in terms of lambdas. Um, that also gave rise to the lambda the ultimate uh, website uh, and so on. So, Anton implemented a small scheme interpreter with a closure-based um, object system. Now, as I said, scheme, very important language to our story. Um, uh, and I mentioned uh, Gerald Sussman. Uh, Gerald Sussman, um, so Abelson Sussman and uh, Sussman, um, so uh, uh, Gerald's wife, um, Julie Sussman, um, uh, they defined, uh, they wrote this book, Structural Interpretation of Computer Programs. All the examples are in Scheme. It's basically an introduction to com computation and computer science in that. But one of the most interesting things in here is that they borrowed an idea um, and expressed an idea from the original Lisp, which is uh, what we would call homo iconicity, the ability of a language to represent itself in itself. In fact, you get it with cross compilers. Um, probably I first came across the idea actually to do with C. Um, compilers. The idea that you could write a C compiler in C, I really remember thinking, oh, how is this even possible? Clearly, you need a bit of bootstrap code. You need to write some of it in assembler. But once you've got it, you can do it. Once you build it up. And so in their book, they define a simple scheme interpreter in scheme. Um, and it looks like this. This is the heart of it, eval, to evaluate an expression with respect to an environment. And we can see cond, that's basically um, a kind of uh, a cascading if-else-if statement, um, uh, and each condition. Is this expression self-evaluating? If so, it's just itself. Is this a variable? If so, look up the variable in the environment according to this expression, and so on and so on. And we see right in the middle of the page, um, is this expression a lambda? If so, make it a procedure by capturing its closure, its environment, um, and uh, with respect to the parameter. So the reason they did this is not just to create another Lisp. In fact, it was going to be originally called Schema, but the operating system they were working on only allowed six letters for the name. So uh, Scheme uh, is what it became. 
Um, but it followed in a tradition in the AI community at the time, which tended to use Lisp, of creating Lisp dialects to solve or look at certain problems. And the naming was Mapper, Planner. These are two other examples. Schema was going to be the name, but they decided to shorten it to that. But what they were specifically exploring was not what we would think of in terms of AI. They were very specifically exploring um, an idea uh, Carl Hewitt had introduced in 1973, the idea of actors. This work developed out of an initial attempt to understand the activeness of actors. The interpreter attempted to intermix the use of actors and lisp lambda expressions in a clean manner. So lambda expressions, and then they coined the idea of alpha expressions for actors. But when they built it, when they wrote it, they said when it was completed, we discovered that the actors and the lambda expressions were identical in implementation. So this, I'm reconstructing history here. This is not actually the code that they did, but um, as I'm familiar with the story, basically they took this, they added something for the alpha expressions. And when you look at them side by side, it's like, oh my goodness, these are the same concept. Um, this is also, by the way, a reminder, keep your code kind of clean and light. If your code is so large that you cannot see these opportunities of duplication. Du when things are duplicated, sometimes they are duplicated because somebody copy and paste them, but sometimes they are duplicated by coincidence. Um, they have no meaning to one another. Sometimes the coincidence is deep and they do have meaning. It means in this sense that objects, the, the kinds of objects represented by actors, they are objects. They capture state and behavior and they are the same as closure-based lambdas. So on his next walk, uh, with Kuknar, Anton attempted to impress his master by saying, Master, I have diligently studied the matter and now understand that objects are truly a poor man's closures. Kuknar responded by hitting Anton with his stick, saying, when will you learn closures are a poor man's object? At that moment, Anton became enlightened. You see, they are, uh, there, there's this point here. They are all of these things. They are not, they, they, sometimes we try and describe paradigms as being mutually exclusive to one another, but in truth, paradigms have a huge overlap. Um, this uh, paper from 2009 by William Cook um, on understanding data abstraction revisited, he makes this lovely observation. Lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. And there's a lot that we can kind of reflect on from here. In fact, we can have a bit of fun with C++. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, um, we're going to define a stack. Um, I'm going to mark out everything that is standard using std colon colon. The stack we're dealing with here is not the one that you will find um, in the uh, STL. A stack of words. We're going to create a stack whose instances are immutable, but we're also going to use lambdas. So to demonstrate this, um, when we created a new stack, words, its depth is zero. Um, and uh, its, um, its top, we're going to use optional. There is no top, so it's null opt. Um, we're going to push C, and then we're going to push C++. But notice my usage. Um, when you are dealing with... Um, uh, a, a more functional style, then if your data structures are immutable, then you are not modifying the stack. You are returning a stack. You're not really saying, here is words, push C onto it. What you're actually doing is you're saying, here is words, give me, what, uh, give me the result of pushing C onto it. And the original stack is unaffected and unchanged, and you get the result back. And likewise with C++. So hence why we rebind or reassign uh, words. And now the depth is two, and the top is C++. And if we pop, then we will see that the top becomes C. So there's a number of ways you could implement this, just based on the syntax I've shown. But we're going to have fun here. I'm going to implement this just using lambdas. The only thing I'm going to allow myself to do is have a constructor, a default constructor. That gives us something empty. And a constructor that allows me to construct from a value and an existing stack. So in other words, a new stack is an old stack with a new head. And then we need to outline the depth. There are four operations. The depth tells me how deep it is. The top is the top element. Pop, pops a result, um, doesn't return anything. Uh, it's void. Um, and push does this. You may not have been expecting this. I am defining depth, top, pop, and push as being functions or function objects. And these are going to be defined in terms of lambda. So in other words, there's, you'll notice there are no, there's no other data members. We are going to hold the state of the stack within its own functions. What that means in practice is that depth, for an empty stack, the depth is always zero. Because remember, you can't change a stack. 
Yeah, it's side effect free. These are pure functions. We, we, here we are definitely doing functional programming. Um, an empty stack is always an empty stack. An empty stack never has a top. Um, and uh, we're going to say for pop that it's simply an empty stack simply returns an empty stack. That's it. You pop an empty stack, you get an empty stack. There's no change. The change happens when we say, and now push. When we do a push, then what we return is a stack that has our previous stack, which is empty, and our new top. That means we need to care about this function. When we have the, um, uh, for a non-empty stack, then the depth is always one plus whatever the depth of the tail is. Um, the head is always whatever was passed in as the head. The tail is always whatever was passed in as the tail and push, same story again. It's whatever I am pushed with something and then added the new, uh, new value. Uh, and we could do a bit of tidying up with the um, captures, um, and, but that's it, that, that's it. So what we've done is we've created a stack using pure lambdas. Now let's go back to the 1970s and have a bit of fun. 60s and 70s, there's this idea of structured programming. I've already told you about this relationship between procedures um, and um, this idea of a procedural abstraction that, that uh, as observed by Uli Johan Dahl um, and Tony Hoare, higher in hierarchical program structures, one of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. So if we would do this in an Algol-like language, not Algol 68, but uh, based on Algol 60, I'm going to create a stack of uh, items, uh, a stack of rocks, say. So we're going to build a stack of rocks, and it's going to have some kind of capacity. It's got some kind of count. We're going to initialize the count to zero, and you can embed procedures within blocks. So blocks are, what are blocks? Blocks can take, have data, they can have procedure, and they can have executable code. That is what a block is. And we're familiar with blocks, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, and the idea of the stack frame. When you enter a stack frame, you basically, the, you know, the compiler will push the data on, we'll execute the code. If there were any procedures, well, you can't do that quite in C++, then uh, or nested functions, um, we would be looking at those. But this is this idea, what is a block? A block is a thing that contains executable code, data, and procedure or function. That's a really interesting idea. What if instead of ending when you leave the closing curly bracket, what if that combined state and behavior could be passed around? And that was the basis of object orientation in 1967. Uli Johan Dahl um, and Kristen Nygaard uh, developed Simula 67, which was an extension of Algol 60. They took the idea of the block and the procedure and they said a procedure which is capable giving rise to block instances. Notice this idea, this language of instance. The idea that once you leave the block, it doesn't disappear on the stack frame. It will be known as a class and the instances will be known as objects of that class. In other words, you get to pass that around. That is where the whole idea of object orientation came from. And take that code. All you need to do is just add this and suddenly, boom, you've just invented object-oriented programming. Now, it's a notational distinction here and we've got used to seeing the word class and in fact, the C++ developers, all of that history is erased from the language C++. It doesn't allow you to treat blocks uniformly. You have to use the class keyword or struct. And so a lot of this useful stuff has actually disappeared, uh, which is a shame because it would probably make the language a lot simpler as well as um, a lot more powerful. Um, of course, notation matters. Um, the physicist Richard Feynman said, we could, of course, use any notation we want. Do not laugh at notations, invent them, they are powerful. In fact, mathematics is, to a large extent, invention of better notations. So where did the lambda come from? Alonzo Church used this, and you know, when we're applying it to something, there's, there's a couple of different stories. Um, the one I prefer most, I and mean, Alonzo Church asked at different times about why did you choose the symbol lambda? Um, one story later in his life, he said, oh, it just looked nice. But actually caught from earlier in his life, um, there is a different story. What he originally wanted to write was this. In other words, the hat, the, um, uh, the uh, circumflex um, was the idea of functional abstraction. This is a mark I will put above something to demonstrate functional abstraction with respect to uh, this variable. Uh, now, Alonzo Church is American, and you might be able to find a lot of printers in the 1930s that could print this in France. But in America, they said, yeah, you know what, could you choose a different symbol? So this um, was uh, uh, one of the initial candidates, move the hat. 
It's like, oh, wait a minute, that looks a lot like this letter, which is why we ended up with this. Now, different programming languages have chosen different things. You know, you can see this in Lisp, you can see it in Python. Um, uh, Haskell goes minimal, backslash. Um, JavaScript in its original form goes maximal, function. Um, Clojure, um, a Lisp-based JVM language, um, uh, Lisp-inspired JVM language, uh, a very functional language uses FN. What I find interesting is that technically there's nothing in Clojure that is called a lambda. Um, lambdas are not a are not mentioned in Clojure. These are called anonymous functions, which I think is ironic because the logo for Clojure is actually using a lambda, but the language doesn't have a thing called a lambda. So there's an irony there, and I don't know if that is intentional or not. Um, we see these shorter hand forms. So um, JavaScript introduced arrow functions. This is the form that was used in C-sharp. Um, we see it in Scala as well. Um, Java and uh, 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 Java and others have used the uh, the uh, lighter arrow. In C++, we ended up with this, which gives rise to some great syntactic fun. Um, you can write the following. So this is actually legal C++, um, and uh, it basically is a function. It's a, it's a lambda that uh, captures nothing, takes nothing, returns nothing, and does nothing. And to prove that it does nothing, you just apply it, and you get nothing. But the best example... Uh, somebody gave me was this one from uh, uh, Shafiq Yagmore. Uh, this is legal C++. <laughs> Again, does nothing. The point I made earlier, I want to emphasize that C++ lambdas are lambdas. They, they satisfy the three laws, corresponds to this. I do have a small wish list item. I find it frustrating that most of my lambdas are single expressions, but I have to go and put semicolon and return in them. On my wish list, I'm hoping in future we will end up with something like this. I'm involved in the, um, uh, the UK standards panel for C++. Maybe I should put through a proposal for this one day. But I would like to see this lighter syntax uh, become uh, a possible thing. Anyway, let's go back to counting. Let's go back to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. One of the protagonists, one of the characters, Ford Prefect, at one point says, oh, God started to count to 10. He was desperately worried that one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. Counting. We looked at this earlier. Let's re refresh our memory. This is what it looks like if I write it out in this kind of longhand way. I'm not going to do the abbreviated lambda fx form. I want to keep it a single parameter. If I translate this to JavaScript, actually JavaScript, I'm going to say, is the easiest of the mainstream languages <clears throat> to translate this into. It looks like this. I can go straight away and do that. I could also take that successor idea, apply uh, kind of Pinot axiom thinking to this, and I've got that, and I can define successor like this. I can also do this in C++, but I need a bit more syntax. But let's let's start from that because I'm not going to I'm not going to do the longhand form in C++. Uh, let's start from this one. What does what does suck look like in C++? It looks like this. Um, and that's not putting everything on one line. If you, you can put it on one line if you like, but I like, it. I like people to read my code. Um, so we are going to say that this is the successor relationship. And notice the nesting of lambdas. That's to cater for the fact that we are um, going back here. We are taking on basically three parameters or three levels of lambdaness, and that's what's going on here. We're also going to find zero as our starting point. This is what zero looks like. We do not, we take f, but we do not apply f. So we'll take that as red, and then we've now got all of our numbers defined. This, which is kind of cool. Now, at the moment, this is not doing anything. As if you remember, I said that these numbers are, they represent not things, but doingness or application of something. We need something to apply. So let us apply an operation that does actually add one to an integer. I'm going to call it plus one, and I'm going to define it in lambda form to be consistent. What I have put here in a different color, n plus one, I've done, I've put it in a different color because if you like, all the stuff in white is the kind of what lambda calculus, pure lambda calculus would look like in C++ if I could do it. All the stuff from, all the stuff in a different color is I'm borrowing from C++'s type system. I said originally lambda calculus, the original lambda calculus, the untyped lambda calculus, as opposed to the typed lambda calculus, 
does not have any integers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow in from C++. I'm going to say, I'm going to use your integers. I'm going to be able, I want to use their operations. I want n to be something that understands plus one. So uh, anything that's not part of the land characters that I'm passing in um, is going to be uh, in a different color. So we're going to take zero. Zero is not really a thing in the classic sense of a thing. Zero is a thing that you can apply to something. We're going to apply it to plus one. And what does that give us? Well, it gives us a thing that we can apply to a value. This is the F, where is the X? Well, I'm going to borrow from C++'s number system, and I'm going to borrow the number zero. And when I do this, I get the result zero. So we managed to recreate integers. Now it gets more interesting. What happens with one? Well, we get one. What happens with two? We get two. In other words, what is happening is the n plus one operation is being applied to the result of the n plus one operation is being applied to the result of the n plus one operation when applied to zero. That's kind of cute. So in other words, this is what we mean. So this is why this idea of numbers are themselves iterations. A number represents an iteration. It represents uh, an occurrence of doing. Them. But let's have a bit of fun. So a number of years ago, I wrote the lexical cast um, uh, uh, kind of operator. That's part of Boost. Um, so uh, one of the things I submitted uh, was lexical cast. I did numeric cast and also any. Um, but the one of interest here is lexical cast. I'm going to take the decal type. Whatever the type of n is, I'm going to use that for my next class. I'm going, to I'm going to cast 1 to the appropriate corresponding type. So therefore, if 1 is an integer, then it will come out as the integer 1. But, uh, oh sorry, if n is an integer, then what we will get is 1 comes out as an int. But if it's a string, then it'll come out as 1. So this still works as we did, but now this is quite cute. What now happens, if I pass in an empty string, then what happens is we add one to it. But one now gets added as a string one. And we invent a unary number system. Okay, uh, not binary, but unary. Unary is the number of ones that you just have. Now, this is kind of fun. What happens when we do square? Let's go back to square. Um, can we express square? Well, yes, square in lambda calculus is just the two-ness of m. What does that mean? It means I'm going to apply a number to itself. That makes sense, doesn't it? Square, seven times seven. If I apply seven to itself, then I'm going to end up with huh, sevenness, sevenness, which, you know, if we put it through our number system, gives us the answer 49, which you've been waiting for. Okay, so we are on the home straight. Let's, let's give a name to this approach. All of this stuff, these are church encodings, church numerals they're called. But church encodings can be applied to other things. They can also be applied to logic. Here is the man that gave us the concept of the Boolean, George Boole. Um, and the book that he wrote, um, often called The Laws of Thought, but in the 19th century, he wrote this when he formalized proposition calculus, an investigation of the laws of thought on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. Whew, exhausting. Turns out we can do church encodings for Booleans as well. Truth is in short supply these days, so here's what it looks like. True and false. What are these? Well, this is what they are. Um, true is the lambda abstraction of A and B, and it yields A. False is the lambda abstraction of A and B, yields B. So in other words, these are selection mechanisms. So just as numbers were iteration mechanisms, these are selection mechanisms. And in fact, church, the church encoding of um, this we actually find in the heart of small talk the kind of a, the, one of the original programming lang uh, object oriented programming languages and the original dynamic object oriented programming language um, booleans in small talk are uh, logic is done using polymorph well is done using basically church encodings it's done using polymorphism seven times seven less than limit I'm asking a question. What that yields is a Boolean object of some kind. And then I send it two requests, or I send it a, sorry, I send it one message which consists of two parts. If it's true, we're going to return OK. If false, oh dear. And there is a class called true that when it receives the if true, if false message, will evaluate the first one to do. 
and there's a class false that ignores the first one and evaluates the second one. So in other words, the Booleans, there's no such thing as an if statement in Smalltalk. Um, what you're doing is you are giving two blocks to a Boolean object and it will evaluate the right one. It will select the right one. If it's a, so this is polymorphism, it's church numerals. Is it functional programming? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, it's a point of view. Um, so this is what false looks like, but I want to refer to something I talked about earlier in the talk, alpha equivalence. I could replace A and B with anything. I could also replace it with this, which basically means that false is indeed zero. You knew it all along. We knew it all along, okay? In church numerals or church encodings, it turns out that false and zero are equivalent concept just as they are in C. But we can go further than this and we can have a bit of fun here. This is the kind of fun we're going to end the talk with. We could define pair. A pair is an encoding of two functions with respect to a function that applies them. And then I can take a pair and I can apply another um, uh, set of lambdas to get the first result or the second. I can recognize that what's on the right hand side we've already seen. We've just invented pairs, but pairs, the second one can hold any value. It turns out that I can create lists. A pair can hold a pair, can hold a pair, can hold a pair, which make, gives us the constructs that are primitive to Lisp. In Lisp, you can construct something. When you construct a list, it is effectively cons. It is a construction of the head and the tail, the first part and the second part. Car reads the first part, um, and Kuda reads uh, yields the second part. These are quer queries for first and second. You need a way of terminating your list. It can't go on forever. So we will use false, which is nil. We've just reinvented Lisp. We can take this. We can also relabel it. We've just gone and reinvented, as it were, our stack. These are all kind of equivalent ideas. So this is kind of a bit of fun, but this brings us to the end. And what we see is this deeper idea. As I, uh, this nice quote from Andrew Koenig, who um, used to be on the C++ Standards uh, Committee, and he was a, um, a work colleague of Bjarne Straustrup. Uh, he said this in the early 1990s, people who brook no compromise in programming languages should program in Lambda calculus or machine language. And I'm gonna say, do it in Lambda calculus because machine language is based on ones and zeros and we have seen how we can invent our own ones and zeros. So Lambda calculus is the more fundamental truth of the universe. Thank you very much. So I guess we're good for questions now. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful talk. Thank you. It's really inspiring. Ivan, do you have questions? Um, I have a couple. Uh, so yeah, uh, there is a saying uh, that if you ask to functional programming what functional programming is, that you're going to get uh, three different answers at least. Uh, so <laughs> I would like to ask you what is FP for you and would you pick, if you had to pick a single feature that you would say all functional programming languages need to have, which one would you pick? Um, functions are first class objects. That's for me the, the, the key idea. The, if functions are first class objects, doesn't matter if they're named or unnamed, if they are first class objects, then that means they are fundamental to the type system. They are fundamental to how we define the world, how we think about them. They are fundamental in being able to be passed around and they become our units of composition and it's that composability. So I'd say that that for me, it's to do with the functions. Um, secondary is, can I do anonymous functions? In other words, lambdas. Um, but firstly, it is they have functions and functions are the center of the universe. They can also have data abstraction um, I don't need to worry about immutability because if I'm talking about mathematical functions, then you get immutability for free. Um, uh, so basically it's the idea of the functions are, you know, conventional function flow is the most important idea and functional co functions are first class concepts. That for me is functional programming um, as distinct from other, the other things that often people associate with functional programming. Many people associate things to do with type systems. Nope, that's not part of functional programming. It's common with, but it's not necessary to. Um, immutable state, actually, 
you get, as I said, you get that for free. I can do immutable state in non-functional languages, but functions are called, it's called functional programming for a reason, it's to do with functions. So for me, that is the starting point and other things flow or get drawn into that. Uh, um, I would say that's how I think about it. I guess when you say that fun, uh, functions are first class, you also mean that uh, unlike, let's say, an average Joe from the street would consider a higher order function a function. And I'm assuming that you also imply that uh, if something is um, a function first language, then it needs to support higher order functions as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you, you're correct in uh, reading that in. It's the idea um, functions are truly first class because they are, they can be used higher order. They can be used to be passed around. Um, you know, they are not, functions are not merely a skeleton that you add data to. Um, functions themselves are part of that data set, if you like. So, yeah. Okay, that's the correct answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I win. Brilliant. Okay, now I'm going to go for my fourth coffee of the day in that case. We will send you the deck. Uh, okay. Excellent. So, next question. Would, do you want another Sergey? Uh, I have uh, a question, talk related in a, in a way. Uh, you mentioned that the, this talk is not for production code usage. So I'm really wondering of your motivation. So I have, I really enjoyed this talk. I've seen it before and I, it was wonderful to see it again. So I, but I'm always interested in your motivation. I have my motivation to listen and it's really interesting for me. And I had like, my brain always clicks and I, I actually hear it makes some noises when I try to comprehend stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> it's really interesting to uh, understand your motivation. So why, uh, what's, what's uh, moving you to do this kind of stocks? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because um, it, it, I, I give a variety of different talks at different times. And in each one, there is a different driver. Sometimes I'm trying to work out how to solve a problem. And sometimes it's a problem that I've seen one of my clients has. And you know, it, it's very practical. And I'm trying to really understand, oh, okay, what's the best way to test this, to express this? What is the cleanest design? All this kind of stuff. But sometimes what I'm trying to do is, is understand something bigger. something. So in this talk, I guess there's a few things that I, I, I think are interesting. Um, I am motivated to understand the history. I think we're not very good at history in software development. We don't have a very long history, but we're also not very good at it. We should be better at it, given how short it is. I am interested in where these ideas don't just pop into existence overnight. You know, lambdas weren't invented suddenly um, uh, overnight. They had been around for a long time before, and they have gone through, they've been used in different ways. They've been applied in different languages. And I was really interested in this, what is the story behind it? I, I know where we are now, but what is the story that led? And if I understand the history, that sometimes tells me some of the things that we are missing now, or some of the insights, it's just like, oh, I now that makes, you start understanding, you say, you say that makes more sense. It means that we can pick up things that we forgot. We can understand the motivations of other people who came before us. And we go, oh, okay. But it also makes the idea more complete. And I think one of the biggest problems anybody has with either programming language features or code bases um, is to understand often how does this work? Why is this here? And th th that question of why is it here is often incompletely answered. And the idea here is, well, let's really go and find out what were lambdas for and what, how is they, have they impacted history? But when we, the minute you start looking at history, you have to look at all the other languages. And what I find is really interesting is when you do that, you don't just see an explosion of ideas, you see convergence. It's the idea that all of these things are tied together in a much more profound level. It's like, um, it's like a root system um, of a forest. Uh, at, the, at the top level, above the surface, you just see distinct trees. But if you go beneath the surface, you realize they are all interconnected. Um, and for me, that I think programming languages are really interesting because each one tries to say, something either it tries to say something different or it tries to express the world from a different point of view it basically says 
okay, I yeah, C plus plus's premise is I need a systems programming language that my colleagues can understand. So this is Bjarne's kind of story. He's working at AT and T. We're doing systems programming stuff at AT and T. He's thinking we're using this language called C. But I learned some really interesting ideas when I looked at Algol and when I looked at Simula that I think are the, that I want to bring into this because I think it will extend our thinking. So in other words, a, a programming language is a way of thinking. And that's what I think is exciting is because when you start looking back at the history and then also the other languages, they each give you these different bits of thinking. And some of those thinking makes you think deeper. So as I say, in nothing in this talk is really directly practical for your work, but the thinking, the insights you have, the ability to take an idea or what I think is more interesting, sometimes you see things as two separate ideas. And what I what in my talk, sometimes you realize, ah, these are not two separate ideas. These are two sides of one idea. I now understand this one idea is much deeper and it allows you to think more deeply when it comes to design and code. You start looking at problems. You go, wait a minute, if I take this problem and I turn it around, I have a solution. I have a way of going forward. And that I think is also helpful when somebody presents you with new techniques or new paradigms. Um, so it's, it's a learning exercise. I, I'm Partly I do this talk so I, I can understand because I... To, to do this, I have to get, I can't just have the thoughts in my head. I have to work out how I'm going to say them. So it forces me into that. But hopefully somebody else is going to see something that they didn't see before. And that when they come to learn something new, maybe it's a new API, maybe it's a new programming language, maybe it's a new architecture. They look at it and they suddenly go, and now I see it differently. And I understand that. The, so if you're migrating to functional programming, suddenly something becomes easier because you realize there's a unification of ideas. So that's my motivation. It's very much a, it's, it's a knowledge-based one. I'm really interested in the broader idea rather than just how I do this particular C++ um, uh, project or system. It's how do I think in this stuff and get better at thinking in design and code. Thanks a great deal. Uh, it was a really <coughs> interesting talk to me as well. Uh, I now realize that I, did not really introduce you correctly because I said it will not be, it was not going to be a deep dive, but well, it most definitely was. And just like you mentioned, <laughs> uh, the way you connected all those things together, even with Douglas Adams, with all those works from the, uh, for many, many years ago, it made the click in my head. And indeed, like you said, some things now actually look easier. So thank you a lot for, yeah. a lot for this. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a lot of activity in the chat. I suppose uh, the main reason is that uh, uh, the talk is in English. The, the English is not a native language for the audience, but uh, yes. I do hope that uh, people will join you in the discussion zone, uh, which uh, uh, you can uh, join by clicking the link that is uh, in Telegram or in the uh, UI somewhere underneath uh, the progress bar. And uh, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. And thanks. Uh, thank to you Sergei. very much. I'm going to go and get Even myself. Well. I'll get myself another coffee and then I will join you in there. We'll see you there in Zoom. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Again. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.